Hey guys, it's Robert. Uh, today I'm going to do a top five for you, and this is top five psychological terms that are misused. So these are things that are from the field of psychology, a variety of different areas in psychology, but they're terms that I hear often misused in media or in everyday life, things like that. So what we're going to do is count them down, and these aren't by any means like the most common. These are just the ones that I hear a lot. So first one is negative reinforcement. Now, when you think of negative reinforcement, what do you think of? Usually when I hear it, people are thinking about the situation where there's a child who's acting out, he's being, you know, he or she's being annoying at the dinner table or something, and the parents give them attention by saying, no, stop that, sit down. You know, they stop what they're doing to correct that behavior. Now, that is not negative reinforcement. However, it does kind of sound like it, right? Because they're reinforcing that behavior, they're giving them the attention that they want, and it has kind of a negative feel to it but that's actually not negative reinforcement. So reinforcement is the term for rewarding a behavior and that in turn increases that behavior. Um, and in psychology, we kind of divide it up into different ways. So positive and negative, and then reinforcement and punishment. Punishment would be something that you do to decrease the behavior. In the field of psychology, when we're talking about reinforcement, the positive and negative don't have anything to do with the quality of the behavior, whether it's, or the quality of the reinforcement, if it's something good or bad. That means positive, you're giving something. Negative, you're taking something away. So positive reinforcement would be, um, you know, clapping for somebody, giving them a reward, giving them candy, giving them money, whatever it is, giving them kudos, right? Doing something that's good, giving them something good to increase that behavior. So you get an A on your report card, you get 20 bucks, right? That's positive reinforcement. Now, negative reinforcement. So if you think about it, negative means taking something away. Reinforcement means you're increasing the behavior. So that means that with negative reinforcement, you're taking away something bad, right? So you're taking away something bad, negative reinforcement. When you take away something bad, that means that the behavior is going to increase. Best example of this is using medication. So this morning, I woke up with a headache, drank a little bit too, too much wine last night. I woke up with a headache, I took Excedrin migraine, and that reduced my headache. That was a form of negative reinforcement because I took the medication and it alleviated the bad thing. It took away the bad feelings, which in turn would cause me to use that medication again in the future. So that's negative reinforcement. It is not when you're you know, giving attention to somebody like when they don't deserve it or when they're acting out. That is just called reinforcement. That's positive reinforcement. You're giving them what they want and that increases their behavior. Now on the flip side with punishment, same kind of thing. So positive punishment doesn't mean you're doing something good for them. That means that you're giving something bad. So positive punishment would be like hitting somebody or um, reprimanding them, you know, that kind of thing. So you're giving something negative, giving something bad, I should say, negative and <laughs> don't wanna get you confused with the positive and negative. Um, and then negative punishment would be taking away something good. So taking away their Xbox or, you know, favorite toy or something like that. Um, so that would be negative punishment. So again, positive reinforcement, giving something good, negative reinforcement, taking away something bad, both of those increase behavior. And then negative punishment is uh, taking away something good, positive punishment is giving something bad. So let that sink in, and then next time you hear somebody say, oh, you're just giving your kid negative reinforcement, you can go, actually, probably don't do that, they'll probably get mad at you. Okay, number two is bipolar. Now, this is one, I think a lot of people do understand what bipolar is, but I often hear it misused still to this day. Uh, bipolar used to be called manic depressive disorder or manic depression, a variety of terms that are kind of like that. And bipolar does not mean that you have mood swings. It doesn't mean that you have good days and you have bad days. Bipolar is kind of a very specific diagnosis for certain behaviors. So bipolar, what you have is uh, depression and that depression looks very similar to what you might see in like major depressive disorder so you know sadness tearfulness loss of appetite changes in sleep uh, lack of motivation inability to feel pleasure those sorts of things the really gross icky depressive stuff that you've probably become familiar with either in yourself or in other people it sucks right um, but you have depressive phases so you go through a long extended period of being depressed and then on the flip side of that, it's called bipolar because there's two different poles, two different sides to it. So depression's on this side. And then on the other side, you have what's called mania. Now, mania does not just mean that you're in a good mood. And it doesn't mean that you're having a normal day where your depression alleviates. It's on the opposite end of the spectrum. So mania actually means that you're elevated and kind of euphoric. 
So it has to be something that occurs over a period of two weeks at least, and it's an extended period of feeling like you're energized. Oftentimes people go without sleep. They feel like they don't need any sleep, like they're running on a motor. Uh, lots of creative energy. Uh, a lot of people that I've worked with, for instance, will like start new businesses or decide to sell their house and move, do really impulsive things because they have this overwhelming creative energy. Uh, and like I said, impulsivity is something that comes along with that. So making bad decisions, uh, lack of judgment, things like that. So manic phases are actually really difficult because it feels good to be manic, but you can also wreak havoc on yourself by not taking good care of yourself, not sleeping, making poor decisions and things like that. So when you come back to the depressive side, you really crash. So bipolar does not mean just having mood swings. A lot of people say, well, I'm really bipolar. You know, I, I have bad days and I have good days. That's not what that means. Now there's bipolar one and bipolar two. Bipolar one is what I was just describing. Bipolar two is very similar, except you have what are called hypomanic phases. And hypomanic phases are basically manic phases that are sort of sub thresholds. So they're not quite at the level of a full blown manic phase. And the duration is shorter. So we're talking about, you know, um, four days or so rather than two weeks. But it's basically the same thing, just kind of toned down a little bit. So you have the depressive episodes consistently, and then you have these uh, little hypomanic episodes that happen as well. So that's bipolar. Okay, number three is dyslexia. So you guys have all heard the one about the guy who walked into a bra. That's bad, right? <laughs> a patient actually made that joke to me yesterday. So um, dyslexia does not mean reading words backwards or seeing things backwards or having right and left confused. A lot of people think that that's the case. Now that can be an issue for some people with dyslexia or different disorders of reading, but that's not like the clinical defining feature for dyslexia. Dyslexia is a type of learning disability. Learning disabilities are basically things that are related to academic skills. So reading, writing, math, things like that, that are um, discrepant from your overall intelligence level. You can be an intelligent person, but still have a lot of difficulty with these academic skills. That's what we would consider a learning disability. Now, dyslexia is a learning disability of reading. And the fundamental thing with dyslexia, there are, are a few different types and there's more nuance than this, but one thing that I really want you to understand is that it's about phonics. So phonemic awareness is the term that we would use. If somebody does not have good phonemic awareness, they might have dyslexia. Now, do you remember Hooked on Phonics where the commercials would be like, b, all, ball, tr, uck, truck, and put the words together? That's phonemic awareness. Those are phonemes. Phonemes are little pieces of language. So you might think of them, you know, pretty much like syllables, little chunks of language. So b and all, those are two phonemes and you put them together and make the word ball. Now, somebody with dyslexia does not process language in that way. Uh, again, I'm generalizing here, but this is kind of the gist of it. So someone with dyslexia does not process it on the phonemic level. Instead, they have to kind of memorize full words. So they just have to memorize what ball looks like and what ball sounds like and what ball means rather than knowing kind of the constituent pieces. When we look at words as people without dyslexia, and I'm generalizing here, I don't know that all of you don't have dyslexia, likely some of you do, but um, somebody without dyslexia looks at a word, breaks it up into pieces, puts it back together in a full word. They don't do that. And so as a result, it can make it really difficult to read. Uh, oftentimes they're glossing over words or substituting words. Um, people with high intelligence and dyslexia can get by just fine, but they sort of have to brute force it. They have to memorize a lot of words over time. Now, one of the good ways that we test for this, I'm in my office right now where I do a lot of testing of people with learning disabilities, is we give them two different lists. So one of them is a list of words that are normal. They go from easy words to hard. So ball would be an easy word. And then like vicissitude or something like that would be a more difficult word. And then we also give them a list of words that are fake. They're pseudo words, but they're written and they need to read them as if they were real words. So for instance, uh, tuffle or pragment, those are fake words, but you can read them if you have good phonemic awareness. But somebody with dyslexia who has never come across these fake words before needs to try to break it up into pieces and put it back together and they have a very difficult time doing that. So the difference, that discrepancy between the words that they've learned over time and these new words that they encounter and can't really process very well, that kind of really points out dyslexia oftentimes. Like I said, people with dyslexia can often uh, do just fine. A lot of them can really excel, but it's about finding compensation strategies, about trying to train that phonemic awareness and um, kind of just getting by with a lot more effort, which a lot of people with learning disabilities feel like. They just have to try harder than everyone else to do the same thing. And that's real. That means that they have to actually put more effort in because they have to process it in this different way. 
So that's dyslexia. It's not just reading words backwards or seeing things backwards or something like that. Okay, number four is OCD. This one is very often misused and it, it used to kind of grind my gears a bit, but I mean, it is what it is. This is just one that people misuse in common language all the time. So often you'll hear someone go, oh my God, I'm getting so OCD right now, or my OCD is flaring up, or this drives my OCD crazy. That's not talking about OCD. So OCD stands for obsessive compulsive disorder. It is something that's represented by obsessions, which are intrusive obsessive thoughts. For instance, uh, my family is going to die or uh, just recurrent images of things that you don't want that you can't get out of your head. Just recurrent obsessive thoughts that are intrusive that you know are crazy, but you can't stop thinking about them. And then compulsions, which are behaviors that are repetitive in nature. For instance, flipping on a light switch off and on uh, several times, checking a doorknob several times. Um, there's a certain compulsion where people <laughs> do like huffing, they cough. And the whole thing with the compulsions is that they do it until it feels right, but there's no right feeling at the end of that. So they kind of just keep doing it until they're redirected somehow. Oftentimes they're related. So somebody has um, an obsession that correlates with their compulsion. So for instance, if I don't do this enough times, if I don't flip the lights on and off enough times, my family might die in a car crash. They're not really logically related. It's kind of like a superstition, but just ramped up a bit. So for instance, you might have a family member who has to wear a certain hat when they're watching their sports team play. Otherwise they're convinced that they actually have an effect on the outcome or they need to sit in a certain chair. Um, the, uh, that movie Silver Linings Playbook, uh, they did a really great example of how superstition and OCD kind of lay on the same spectrum and how some people kind of mask their OCD with superstitious tendencies. OCD is not just being really anal and wanting orderliness and everything to be straight and right angled and color coordinated and stuff like that. That is actually something that would be referred to as OCPD. And that's if it's bad enough, right? If it's causing them actual problems in real life. Most people, that's just them being annoying. But OCPD stands for Obsessive Compulsive Personality Disorder. So that's kind of a fundamental personality difference in somebody where they're kind of more obsessed with orderliness. They're kind of anal. Uh, and by anal, some of you guys who are international might not understand that, but that basically just means like high strung, uh, lots of attention to detail, needing things to be ordered, squared up, things like that. So that's actually called OCPD, Obsessive Compulsive Personality Disorder. It's, you know, something that is pretty common, but a lot of people who complain about, oh my gosh, this is my OCD, that's just them kind of being, you know, themselves. If it's a disorder, that means it has to be actually causing them problems in their life, in their work, in their relationships, and things like that. So OCD, OCPD, neither of those are usually what people are referring to, but when someone says, oh my gosh, I'm so OCD, they're not talking about OCD. Okay, number five, let's slide right into it. So number five is schizophrenia. Now, again, a lot of people know what schizophrenia means at, the, at this point in time, but it's also misused quite a bit. So schizophrenia does not mean multiple personalities. Just remember that, lock that away, because a lot of people will uh, talk about it that way. And in common language, we use schizophrenic as an adjective. And I can see why it's confusing because we'll say, you know, this is schizophrenic sort of movie. It kind of has two different sides to it. Or, you know, this art has a very schizophrenic quality to it. We'll, we'll use it as an adjective to mean things that are kind of split. And it does have its roots in the word split. I think that's what that's like the, the schizophrenic, the schizo part of it refers to a split. And it's not about having a split mind where there's one person here and one person here. It's more about a split from reality. So schizophrenia is what would be called a psychotic disorder. And psychosis means that you're having delusions or hallucinations or both. Delusions are unusual beliefs that other people don't have. For instance, a belief that everybody's out to get you, a belief that people are transmitting you secret messages through the radio, um, the belief that people are trying to poison you, the belief that you're a messiah, that you're like the second coming of a messiah, that you're greater than everybody else or something like that. Those are delusions. And hallucinations are sensory experiences that other people don't have. So for instance, seeing things that aren't there, hearing things that aren't there, smelling things that aren't there in some cases, basically any sense of an, an experience that people don't have. So uh, oftentimes people will see other people in their house or maybe they'll hear music when there's no music there or they'll hear voices that aren't actually there speaking to them. It's a very scary disorder and it's, it's about that split from other people's reality. They're kind of in their own world in this way. So you might have somebody who thinks that they're uh, being tracked by the government. That's a very common delusion. Or you might have somebody who thinks that they're being transmitted secret messages on the radio and in TV. That'd be another delusion. 
If somebody has a hallucination of people talking to them, that's different. They may have voices that speak in their head, but they're not separate identities. This is just somebody that's commanding them or berating them or speaking to them in some way. Now, somebody with um, a different disorder, which is called dissociative identity disorder, DID, that is what you might think of as multiple personalities. So in that, they actually have within them multiple personalities that come out at different times. Much, much, much less common than schizophrenia. It's a very uncommon disorder. Uh, a lot of people kind of debate the specifics of it. Some people don't even believe that it exists. It seems to exist. I mean, it's in our handbook back here, the DSM, uh, which is kind of what we use to diagnose mental disorders. This big Bible here. Um, and, it, and it is recognized currently as a disorder, but oftentimes uh, it's, it's really hard to prove. It's really hard to understand. And that's just, uh, like I said, it's a disorder where people have multiple personalities within themselves and they'll come out at different times. You typically, they have a host personality, um, and then several sub personalities. It can be anywhere from one to actually quite a few in some cases, but that's not schizophrenia. That's dissociative identity disorder. So two different things. Uh, schizophrenia means kind of splitting from reality, not splitting up into different people within your mind. So those are my top five. I'm interested if you guys learned anything from this, um, what your experiences are in terms of hearing people misuse psychological terms. Are there any that kind of grind your gears, any ones that you've heard in media or in everyday life? Let me know. Uh, share in the comments and then like and share this video if you want other people to learn about these misused psychological terms. All right. Bye.